Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. This is Greg Oxton with the Consortium for Service Innovation. And Kelly Murray is on the phone, also with the consortium. And our, our goal for this <clears throat> web session was to give you all a, a summary of the member summit that we held last week in Napa, California. It was our 26th member summit. <clears throat> and it's hard to, uh, to pick out the, some of the key topics. There are a lot of, a lot of different topics were covered. Um, so we've tried to hit the highlights here. We had um, 100 attendees, which is, a, which is larger than normal. Uh, for the member summit, we usually have 75, 80 people. I think last year we had 85. So 100 is a good size group. We had eight board members with us, eight certified trainers. There are currently, I think we're up to 44 certified trainers around the world, and about half of those are internal trainers that that operate in centers of excellence within large organizations. And the other half are external trainers that offer, do commercial offerings with KCS uh, workshops and uh, consulting services. Um, so we had eight of those trainers with us. We had 14 consortium innovators. Uh, consortium innovator is a distinction that we uh, make for people that have made a sustained contribution over a long period of time. And so it was great to have that many consortium innovators with us. And we did um, 12, 12 sessions, so there are 12 different um, sessions with 20 speakers. So we had two speakers, or we did a panel that's four, four speakers. So um, that's why there are more speakers than sessions. And then as part of our agenda, we always do open space, which gives the participants an opportunity to nominate topics to discuss. And so we had 12 open space topics. The uh, event started actually on Monday night with a reception. And then Tuesday, we started the, with the content. Um, so this was the Tuesday agenda. In the afternoon, we did, uh, we, we had two tracks. Um, one that was really focused on KCS, and KCS adoption and measures. And the other track was on intelligence warming and artificial intelligence. Um, and then the next day, Wednesday, we had a full day. We did open space sessions in the morning. And then the leadership framework, um, a story from about customer engagement and AI from AARP. And the closing talk was by Dr. Michael Wu, who's been with us many times over the last 10 years. Um, and he gave us some great ways to think about artificial intelligence, mach machine learning, deep learning models, things like that. So in the welcome and context, we, we went through some of the observations around innovation. It's, uh, you know, it's never a big bang. It's always iterative. It really does take a sense of humor. Um, you know, one person will have a crazy idea and somebody else will build on that. It's, uh, that's the iterative nature of it. Um, and we use the design thinking model from the Stanford Business School, which um, has two key pieces to it. We, you, you explicitly try and think of as many different ways to solve a problem as you can. That's the diverge part of the model. Then you pick a few and converge and actually test them and then go back to the, based on what you learn from testing that, you go back to the diverge part of the model. So it's a framework that we've referenced frequently because it's important as we have these conversations for people to understand whether we're diverging and dreaming and talking about what if we could versus we're, if we're talking about um, how would we, which is the converge side of that model. Um, I think in this meeting we did some of both, uh, but it's helpful to be explicit about where you are. 
uh, in terms of which side of the model you're working on. Uh, we covered the value erosion model, the value add models, um, and then the five initiatives. So we have um, five initiatives, all of which intersect with each other that we're working on within the consortium. I think we covered all five in topics within this um, summit. Um, but the five initiatives are KCS, and KCS is starting to expand beyond uh, tech support, and uh, it's showing up in HR and in legal and in professional services. Um, so we continue to evolve the KCS model. That's one of the initiatives. Intelligence forming, which is uh, essentially collaboration on steroids. Um, KCS is about capturing what we know and connecting people to known issues and answers. And intelligence forming is about connecting people to people to solve new. Um, and it replaces the traditional level one, level two, level three model. We'll talk a little bit more about that. But it creates a collaborative team that focuses on problem solving. Um, then there's the predictive customer engagement model, which is a lot of work that's going on in a number of the members' organizations, leveraging data science to data scientists and, and AI and deep learning models to figure out how do we tell customers about things that we know that they would value, but they don't know to ask us for. So it's a, a predictive and preemptive kind of a approach. And then the fourth initiative is the customer success initiative. And that's where journey mapping fits and understanding customer pain points and um, really looking at how do we improve customer productivity and success in the grand scheme of things. And then the fifth initiative is the leadership framework for service excellence. And we'll talk a little bit about each one of those as we look at the sessions that were run. Um, as part of the opening, we just released the KCSV6 adoption guide as part of the opening, Jen Crippen uh, gave a summary of that. She did a lot of work um, on that model. And Jen is um, now one of our consortium innovators. She's been a certified trainer for probably you know, almost 10 years and is one of our most active certified trainers and actually helping members adopt, or customers, sorry adopt KCS. And so we're pleased to welcome her to the to the group of consortium innovators. Again, folks who have been with us a long, long time and made a significant contribution. Jen really helped manage the process of updating the adoption guide and provided some um, lots of uh, insights based on her many years of experience in helping customers adopt KCS. Then uh, David Kay, also one of our consortium innovators, did uh, did a talk on the alignment between Agile uh, as a development methodology and um, KCS, and really looking at a model for Agile support. Um, Agile support does for support what Agile development did for development. And the, the alignment is really um, quite striking in that Almost all of the principles that, that are the foundation of the Agile model uh, can be found in KCS, um, especially if you add intelligence forming to that. If an organization is doing both KCS and intelligence forming, they're essentially doing Agile support. Um, and we're finding that the people who really understand Agile are pretty quick to recognize those, uh, the alignment between the two. Um, so when organizations are trying to convince their folks to embrace KCS or intelligence forming or both. It's helpful to point out the alignment. If they're already doing agile in the development shop, then um, it's helpful to point out those, the, the alignment between the two. I was with one of our members, Financial Force, who's embraced uh, intelligence forming. They were already doing KCS. They're now about a year into their intelligence forming model. And it was actually the development, the vice president of development who was encouraging the support organization to drop their levels of support and embrace this idea because he saw how well it connected with, uh, with the agile development model. So that was 
that was pretty interesting. Um, and David posed a question, which then we had a group go off and talk about in the uh, open space sessions. Agile uses an entirely different vocabulary, so similar concepts and very much the same principles, but they have different words <laughs> that they use to describe what they do. And so there's a question on the table in terms of updating the KCS vocabulary to align with the Agile vocabulary. Then that was followed up by a presentation by John Schmey. Uh, John Schmey, also one of our consortium innovators, been with us ever since the beginning of the consortium. And John and Livia Wilson were the authors of the very first KCS Practices Guide. Um, so John has a very rich and long background with the consortium's work. He's been spending the last few years at Verint um, helping Verint uh, clients uh, with a content management strategy. And it's it's organizations like insurance companies and big banks and, and groups that, you know, not, not just tech support, but groups that have lots of compliance requirements and legal requirements. And, and uh, the old content management strategy was a waterfall approach. And the new content, the emerging content strategy is actually more of an agile approach. Uh, where they're using the KCS principles to actually create formal documentation, create and improve formal documentation. It's a much more dynamic approach to content management. So this is a big shift because we've always positioned KCS as just-in-time content. It's you know, capture the interaction and what can we learn from that and reuse. And now those principles that we've used for the last 20 years to do that work are starting to be embraced by more traditional um, formal document creation and content management um, organizations. And in John's presentation, he had some advice on how to get started. Then Melissa George, who's on the consortium staff, and Stéphane Penol from uh, France, uh, talked about KCS in professional services, and uh, both of them have been do doing some work with PTC and their professional services organization. And they talked a bit about what's different, uh, the fact that there are no triggers. Professional service organizations have statements of work, but they don't have cases. Um, the nature of their work is quite different in, its, in the time factor. Um, indicators of participation is hard. If you don't have a case or some kind of um, work object, uh, then what do you link an article to if you've reused it? Uh, lots of activity, but n the outcomes are even harder to measure. Uh, then they did it, they facilitated an exercise, which is very interesting. The, the folks at the tables um, all worked on a strategic framework for different business functions. Um, and then the, you know, the feedback from from those was that actually the benefits of doing KCS in any business function that's information or knowledge intensive are very, very similar. It doesn't really matter if you're in HR, legal, professional services, or tech support. The, the reason you would want to embrace KCS and do it is um, you know, the, the consistency, speed of answer, um, eliminating rework, I mean, it's all, all the issues are the same. They're on different scales, but they're the same factors. So that was interesting. And then Matt Seaman, also one of our consortium innovators from PT PTC, talked about their work uh, leveraging AI for customer success. And Matt was one of the instigators of the predictive customer engagement model. And I would say PTC has embraced that as uh, a, a core part of their business capability. And they have a, a data scientist whose name is Stephen Valancourt, who's done a number of uh, web sessions with us on some of the very interesting projects he's doing, one of which was Dylan. Um, so Matt gave a kind of a quick summary of the AI capabilities that they're looking at, uh, machine learning, clustering, net neural networks. And then an update on Dylan, which they talked about at last year's member summit, and it really supports customers as they're doing online case submission, uh, 
and recommends articles that might be the resolution based on what they're what the customer is putting in the case form and they're using uh, a neural network kind of engine in the background to really help uh, find the the best case best article sorry and their success rate is about 33 percent of the time they have an article that is found and recommended and they uh, calculate that they've solved 29,000 cases using Dylan over the last year. And then uh, Matt gave a uh, just a striking demo of augmented reality, um, where a, uh, a flat image became 3D and you could move it around and take it apart and look inside and a uh, really interesting way to deliver information in a, a vis visual and dynamic kind of, um, an interactive kind of way. And of course, some of the AI tools uh, really help with that uh, visualization capability. And then Matt's observation was that the, you know, the AI capabilities aren't necessarily gonna replace human capabilities, but they, could go a long way in complementing human capabilities, making people more effective and efficient. Then we did we did the breakout sessions in the afternoon, and we had, as I mentioned, two tracks. One was mostly focused on KCS, and the other was focused on intelligence warming and a little bit of um, AI um, in there as well. So Monique Kadina from Akamai. Um, has been also one of our consortium innovators and has been the source of a couple of case studies. Um, she just recently joined Akamai to help them adopt KCS. They had tried in the past and it hadn't gone terribly well. Um, Monique has successfully adopted, been the program manager and successfully managed the adoption in a number of different companies. And uh, based on the many things she's learned and the strength of the Akamai culture, she found that this was one of the smoothest she'd ever done and some pretty cool results. Um, and reinforcing um, much of what is in the practices guide and in the adoption guide about executive sponsorship. Uh, the need to focus on middle managers, how important communication is. They had a very strong coaching program, training, and over time, investing in tools, making it, building a platform or an infrastructure that makes it easy for people to do the right thing. And that, that doesn't have to be done immediately or when you start, but over time, the functionality and integration of the capabilities that support people in doing KCS have to continuously improve. Um, so that was a great story. Then Natalie Eckert from DTCC and Mike Griffith from SAP. Um, each of those organizations have implemented a center of excellence and so they, they shared their experience with that. Um, Mike has, at SAP, I think there are 3,000 support agents around the world that they're on a very aggressive uh, path to adopt KCS. Um, and Natalie at DTCC, I think, has uh, six or 700 support agents. And they each have, because of the difference in sizes, they've, there's, you know, there's not just, there, there is no one size that fits all in terms of how you build your center of excellence and whether or not people are full time or part time. Um, it really depends. But some of the things that they focus on in terms of activities are that the Center of Excellence focuses on is educating, supporting, monitoring, and enhancing. And the staff and skills, um, uh, SAP has eight, I think, internal certified trainers. So they have access, as a certified trainer, you have access to all of the uh, consortium's KCS training materials, the instructor-led training materials. And over the years, we've built quite a library of um, course materials. Uh, there's often a lead coach that's part of the COA, COE and a lead KDE. Um, they do program management. They manage issues. 
Um, there's a write-up in the appendix in the recently released KCS V6 Adoption Guide about uh, KCS Center of Excellence and how to build one. Then uh, Sabrina Meditz from Blizzard Entertainment, that's the company that builds a massive multiplayer uh, games. And they've been doing KCS for, uh, I think, two years, two and a half years. And have really done uh, some interesting things with measures. Uh, because of the speed with which the game is played and that issues come up and the volume of people they have playing the game, um, they pay attention to volume and velocity. And one of the first that I've seen that actually have triggers set up in the system, that if an article starts getting reused um, in quickly in a short period of time, um, it, it raises a flag because they know that that, you know, the speed at which that article is being reused is important information. And uh, gamers are terribly impatient. Um, so they're pretty quick to pick up on emerging trends and they have created a measure called velocity, which I thought was very interesting. Um, they also look at something called an impact score. I think this is uh, this is in production, but but relatively new. They're still tuning it, um, and they use this instead of AQI. So rather than looking at how well people are doing writing articles, they're trying to assess the impact, um, and it has to do with engagement, creation, curation, which is modify and improve, and reach. And reach is about you know how many people have they influenced or impacted based on their contribution to the knowledge base. It was a very interesting um, concept. And I think we'll probably be doing some more work on that uh, through the team meetings in the, in the coming months. The other thing that, that uh, Sabrina has done is, is put a tight integration between the knowledge base and the bug tracking system. So developers actually have visibility too the volume and velocity uh, and, and frequency of uh, reuse uh, of articles. And that really helps them prioritize their work and understand the source of some of the bugs that are being reported because they can go all the way back and see not, not just the article but also the cases that were related to that. That's a factor that's been in the KCS Practices Guide for as long as I can remember, but I don't know too many organizations that effectively link their cases to articles, articles to bugs, and you can go forward and backward in that linking. That visibility is, uh, can be terribly informative um, for the whole organization, actually. So they're doing some really interesting things at Blizzard. Um, so that was the KCS breakout, those were three sessions back to back. Then on the other track, we had Bill Ackerman and Red Hat is one of the early adopters of intelligence warming. And he talked, you know, he walked through the history and the evolution of the process and um, talked about some of the challenges that they face. One that's kind of curious is over-specialization um, and some of the things they're doing to mitigate that. Um, it's an interesting problem to have. Uh, the speed with which they're, they've been through tremendous growth over the last three or four years. I think they've doubled in size. And uh, the speed with which they bring on new engineers is uh, has greatly improved because of their swarming model. But they have a, a challenge where people get too specialized too fast and they're working on how they, how they create more generalists in the organization. Then we had a panel, um, Lisa Manchester from ServiceNow, Adam Mano from Financial Force, Salim Sayed from Autodesk, all three of those organizations are doing intelligence warming. They do it in fairly different ways. Um, Red Hat, for example, has an automated matching engine that matches cases to people based on skills profiles and the case attributes. Um, most of, I think all three of these have, oh no, ServiceNow uses some kind of automation to do that as well. Um, Financial Force and Autodesk do it manually. Uh, the case routing is done manually or by a triage team. 
Um, so it's interesting hearing the different approaches. Um, all of them uh, have been very successful. So there, there are many different ways to do, you know, to enable collaboration. Um, and they talked a bit about lessons learned. Uh, Laurel Partner and Sawan uh, Despand from Coveo then gave some examples of how they're using machine learning to improve search results. So in the Coveo search engine, um, they're, they're really working on combining context with content and intent in order to improve relevance. And uh, they're having great success with this. So, so the more a person searches, the better the search results are. Uh, the engine learns based on search activity and, and, and tunes itself, if you will, um, to improve relevance. One of the observations they made was that uh, the real challenge isn't computational, but it's one of imagination in terms of figuring out or recognizing all the various places that some of these emerging capabilities uh, can be leveraged in, in the customer engagement process and, and in the support process and in searching. And so then uh, the next, the, now this is Wednesday morning, we did open space topics. We had 12 topics and uh, quite a diverse set of topics. So again, this is open space for those who haven't done it. This is where uh, the, the attendees in the meeting have the option of proposing a topic and facilitating that conversation. It's, it's best if it's a question, something that we don't know the answer to. And if others in the audience are interested, they show up and we had for that conversation. And we had some groups that had gosh, probably 25 people in them, and then other groups with three people, where the topic was of interest to three people, and they went off and had a great conversation about that topic. So that's a little bit about, about how it works. These are some of the topics. Um, this AI and KCS was one of the ones that had 25 or 30 people attending. A lot of interest in that, and um, we'll, we will be doing some follow-up work on this. Uh, in either web sessions or as a as an agenda item on team meetings. Um, continuing interest in this applying KCS principles to non-support groups that was pretty popular. Uh, let's see what other ones were. I think there are quite a few that attended the KCS across multiple outsource partners. Uh, the how do you make product documentation part of the KCS methodology? This again is that convergence or maybe it's the expansion of um, KCS into as a practice for people who do formal documentation. Uh, so there's some topics, you know, measuring self-service success. We've done a ton of work on that over the years. Um, people still poking at that. So some pretty good interactive sessions. And then each of the groups gave a debrief and we've captured notes um, from each of the groups. I think two of the groups have follow-up activities, the KCS, AI and KCS. You now where are the places in that process in either the solve loop or the evolve loop that you can apply some of these emerging capabilities. And the content question. Um, then we had dinner at the Silverado Winery. So actually the dinner was Tuesday night. Um, that was very nice, although it was rainy and foggy, but it made a little more, it made it, gave it, gave the place a mystique. Then uh, Brad Smith, who's on our board of directors, president of the consortium board of directors, long time uh, contributor, also a consortium innovator, talked about uh, the leadership framework for service excellence. So there are a couple of interesting dynamics as we move um, from these really rigid silos um, to a much more of a network-like model where the silos become permeable and people are collaborating across 
traditional organizational boundaries. And that really changes how, how you know, the leadership model. Um, and then the other element here, there's a lot of work going on in transformation of support organizations to become more customer focused or focused on customer success and productivity, customer experience. Those factors are really influencing the culture of the organizations. And we've done a bunch of work over the years in what we call the leadership framework for service excellence. And apparently there's a, there's a new article that just came out uh, in Harvard Business Review called The Culture Factor. And Brad's, a good portion of Brad's presentation was, look, HBR has published something we've been talking about for 10 years. Um, so it was kind of fun to see that comparison. It was validating of the work we do. And uh, the other question Brad posed that I think is really interesting is as we move to more and more to automation and machine learning and bots and all the things that sort of fit in the realm of artificial intelligence. Um, who's going to program those to really reflect the cultural attributes that we're after and the experience, you know, the brand promise and the customer experience that we're after. It's an interesting uh, challenge. That was Brad's presentation and um, Jim Pendergast, Jim Pendergast, who's also on our board, been with us for many years across multiple organizations. He's now at AARP, really helping them understand the customer experience and move from a essentially a magazine and and uh, hard copy mail model of engagement with AARP members to a digital model. Um, and he showed some interesting research around digital savvy, digital savviness, I guess you might say. Uh, there's perhaps a myth that the older folks are, the less likely they are to be engaged digitally. And there's some research that shows that's in fact not true, that there is a pretty large subset of the over 55 population that are highly engaged di digitally. So Jim's challenge is to create an environment where they're engaging those who want to have a digital experience from a digital point of view, and those who don't with, continue to engage them in the more traditional way. I um, just want to kind of interrupt for one second and yes. say I thought it was hilarious that um, Jim is now having to point out that the group of people that's over 55 actually invented the digital world, <laughs> and so many of them are indeed engaged in online activities. <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there, AARP has, has done a whole bunch of work with journey mapping. That's always been one of Jim's uh, uh, kind of contributions to an organization is really helping them and helping the organization understand the customer experience. Journey mapping is a great tool to do that. Um, and then figuring out where do we, you know, what are those touch points? Can we make digital? And how do we personalize that experience? And they're really doing a lot of work to leverage, um, again, machine learning and neural networks and some of these modeling capabilities to look at content and behaviors and, and cre create a more personalized experience based on that. Um, they have a, a concept of a content concierge and uh, they have many channels and many types of content and they're looking to, and thousands and thousands, I don't remember, the number is mind boggling in terms of the number of members they deal with. Um, and so it has to be automated, the, the personalization and the ability to engage across multiple channels. So that, that was an interesting uh, perspective on the application of some of these emerging capabilities. And then we, we wrapped up this session with a talk from Michael Wu, Dr. Michael Wu, formerly the chief uh, scientist at Lithium, which is a community platform, um, currently independent. And he's been, he's been a great contributor to the consortium over the last probably five to seven years. I think he has two PhDs in, in 
two very interesting things that I, I can't remember what they <laughs> what they're in. But um, there's some there's some really deep academic kind of work and and can explain it to those of us who are not academics. Um, and his uh, observation around this was in, that machine learning um, has really three, there are three things you can do with that. Uh, some of these models, and, and I think uh, neural networks and pattern, uh, you know, cluster, cluster identification and some of those kind of techniques. They can be used to describe a set of data um, in terms of what its shape is or what the clusters look like or what the trend is uh, with a huge amount of data. They can be predictive based on past history. They can predict what is likely to happen in the future. Um, and they can be prescriptive, which is they can make recommendations. Uh, but that the collection of capabilities uh, doesn't make decisions or take action. And that's how he's defined artificial intelligence. Um, things that can make decisions and take action. So a uh, self-driving car is a, an example of artificial intelligence. It is, it is sensing and responding to making decisions and taking action and getting from point A to point B based on what's around it and the rules of the road. Um, and so AI uses machine learning and neural networks and, and lots of these capabilities, but those things by themselves are not AI. AI really requires decision-making and, and the ability, ability to take action. And Michael always has, his, uh, his deck was very entertaining. He essentially made his presentation as if the audience, all of us in the audience were getting first a bachelor's degree and then a master's degree and then a PhD um, in this field <laughs> and had, had some interesting examples of how companies uh, in retail or in, in uh, insurance, I think, oh no, no, it was uh, banking um, approving loans and how they're leveraging some of these capabilities. So very interesting talk. So Kelly, any any other comments? That, that's kind of the summary of, those are the highlights. Um, we were at uh, hashtag CSIMS for Consortium for Service Innovation Member Summit um, on Twitter. And there are a couple of summaries of the event um, that are linked from there also from one from Monique Cadena and one from uh, Stefan Prenault and one uh, sort of a more general run from um, Ari Hoffman this morning. Hmm. So if you're looking for other, other perspectives. Yeah. And I see Jacob is uh, Jacob Watts is on the phone with us. Um, Jacob was there at the summit. Do you have, do you have any, any big ahas or, or things you'd like to share, Jacob? Hmm. We cannot hear you if you're talking. You caught me off guard. I was scrambling to get to my oh. mute button. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, I, great. I, I think you summarized it really well. I'm, I'm really looking forward to connecting with a couple of the folks that were in the open space session on connecting product documentation with KCS. So that's mm -hmm. Yeah, which actually that Sarah, I took away from that. Uh, Sarah Feldman led and she's online also. She's on with us. Oh, yeah. Hi, yes. Looking forward to talking with Jacob and others more about that. Yeah, it was a hot topic. We had some really good conversation around it. A lot of people joined. Yeah. Okay, so some upcoming events. There's a European team meeting held in uh, outside of Munich, Germany, April 9th. Melissa George will be hosting that meeting. There's also the KCS Academy World Tour in Munich, um, April 11th. 
The predictive customer engagement conversation will continue and that will be April 25th in Austin, Texas. That's a team meeting, that's two and a half days. Uh, you can participate in parts of the team meetings via web session. I shouldn't say participate, you can listen in. It's very hard when you have 12 people in the room and people on the phone to participate um, on the phone. There are There is some value um, in listening in as people give presentations and things. Uh, we'll show the presentations on the web session and you can listen to the conversation. Uh, leveraging AI for customer success, that'll be, that's also a team meeting in Boston. And so I think that's where we'll um, talk not only about leveraging AI for customer success, but also maybe leveraging AI to help support engineer or support agent success in terms of complementing their capabilities or making it easier for them to do the right thing. Uh, one of them, actually one of the most intriguing examples we've heard about this is using text analytics to extract phrases from the case, which, which ideally the customer has entered online, um, and then assess uh, the relevance of, so, so it, it could recommend, uh, if you're gonna create an article from a case, uh, it could recommend some content for that article and or using text analytics to do an assessment of the relevance of the article that is linked to a case in terms of the, you know, does the article address the issues that the case addresses? And if it doesn't, recommending phrases from the case that you might wanna to add to the article. And you know, the degree to which we can automate some of this in terms of identifying content, um, identifying relevance, just greatly uh, improves the support agent's ability to do the right thing. A lot less effort on their part. So that'll be August 8th in Boston, Massachusetts. That's a team meeting. Um, KCS and Professional Services, and um, this is hosted by uh, Dell EMC. I saw Ron Plourd is on the line with us. Uh, in Cork, Ireland, so, so there are a number of member companies that are uh, looking at or have started down the journey of uh, embracing KCS within their professional services organization. Dell EMC is one of those, and so they're hosting a meeting on that in September. Uh, Agile for support, uh, KCS for Enter enterprise content management, October 3rd, so that one we added, or, or maybe updated the title of that. Um, I think that's gonna be hosted by MindTouch in San Diego, is that right, Kelly? That is right, yeah. And of course, MindTouch is a content development, content management platform. And uh, they also are doing KCS internally. So that will be interesting. We may do a web session between now and then. October feels like a long way away, but it'll probably be here before we know it. October 22nd, the annual executive summit. So this is a by invitation event. We invite the executives from our member companies. We manage the size to be about 25 to 30 people. We make it conversational. We try not to have PowerPoint slides. Um, and uh, that will be in Seattle, Washington. And then we're looking at a uh, potential team meeting in November, uh, topic to be determined. These are all up on our events page on the consortium site. There's a- Or they will be soon. <laughs> or they will be soon, okay. The near term events are up on our events page and there you can you register there. Um, and then the next big event, the next member summit, we're 90% certain will be on the coast of Maine at a place called the Cliff House. It's about an hour and 15 minutes north of Boston Airport. So not too hard to get to. Um, it'll be April, the week of April 8th. We're still working out some of the details with the hotel. So it hasn't been, uh, the contract has not been signed yet, but we're 90% we're certain that's where we're gonna be. So mark your calendars for the week of April 8th, 2019. My calendar's marked. Thank you, good. 
<laughs> it'll be helpful for you to be there. <laughs> so that's uh, any questions or comments? That's a summary of what we were up to last week. It's a pretty diverse set of topics we covered. Hi, Greg. This is Tara Fuller. Hi, Tara. Um, how are you? Good. I would like to ask a question. I'm very intrigued by the um, text analytics and using um, it to look at the case that's created. Um, was there any mention of actually using the transcript of the interaction itself, so the phone call, um, to perhaps do the same sort of thing? Um, there wasn't, but I know an awful lot of people record and you know, do a quality assurance kind of review of transcripts or recordings. Uh -huh. So it's, so I know um, there's some work doing there's some work going on on speech to text, and there's some the the text analytics capabilities I think in the last three to five years have greatly improved. So I think that's entirely possible. Um, I'm not aware of anybody doing that yet, but it sounds like it makes sense. Yeah, well, and because we do um, here at McKesson have um, the speech analytics piece of Barrett for our recordings, and so mm -hmm. um, it really, you know, my ears perked up when you said that. It's like it's not necessarily analyzing the case transcript, but it's certainly, yeah. Yeah. you know, so um, – I think I want to explore that a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. Good idea. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'll let you so know maybe, how it works out. Well, yeah. Or or come come join us for the KCS AI or the AI and customer engagement meeting in uh, is that the one in Boston? Where was that? Yeah, yeah, that's what I was also thinking. That would probably yeah. be um, because we're also installing some other tools. Um, uh, like Salesforce, um, Einstein, which is kind of running down that path of AI okay. as well. And so yeah. I think it will be, um, I think that's something I need to go ahead and plan for. So yeah. Yeah. good deal, yeah. thanks. Okay, yep. I think the uh, you know, one observation I would make based on numerous conversations over the last year is the the opportunity to leverage these emerging capabilities in text analytics, neural networks, uh, deep learning models, um is is extremely broad uh, it's you know almost any process that we look at in the support world uh leveraging some of these capabilities would complement the support engineers or support agents capabilities in that process and so i think we'll be doing lots of work over the next year. And I know many of the members are, you know, Autodesk has got Watson and people are playing with Einstein and um, data scientists are showing up as part of uh, the support team, you know, in the support organization. Um, and we've done two data scientist web sessions that are, I think Kelly, are those recorded and on our, on our YouTube channel? They are for members. You can get to them, yeah. yeah, from the wiki. Okay. Yeah. So we've had gosh, six or eight data scientists together talking about their role and where they fit in the organization and, and a, a discussion on the projects they're working on and the technologies they're using. Um, and if you're interested in visiting those web sessions, those recorded web sessions, um, I'm guessing there's a link off the wiki. Yep. members. Yep. If you, you can't find them, let me know. Or email Kelly. Kelly, Kelly is our search engine. I'm getting a little nervous about the AI getting good because that's, you know, a lot of my job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Well, if there are no other comments, I think we'll adjourn. Thank you all for joining. Thank you for your interest. Yep. Thank you for the update. Okay. Thanks, Greg. And maybe we'll see you at an event in the coming months. Thanks.